Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Race to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The Book of 1 Samuel chapter 23, David saves the city of Keilah. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we, if we are afraid here in Judah, how much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar the son of Ahimelech had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about six hundred, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. Saul pursues David. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made, made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. And the Zephites went up to Saul at Gebeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Achila, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go, make yet more sure. No one see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the working places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon, and Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying away to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of Engedi. The Book of 1 Samuel Chapter 24 David Spares Saul's Life when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the, Lord, the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and, went on, and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David 
bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your, ha your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of the robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lift up, lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well, well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me therefore by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Amen. The following is the English translation of Pastor Martina Juan's teaching on the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 23 to 24, translated by Bryson. Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Today we'll take a look at 1 Samuel, chapters 23 to 24. First, let's understand David's current state of mind. He had just experienced great fear in Gath, followed by shock and terror from the massacre at Nob, and then despair in the cave at Adullam. We can see from his psalms that he relied on God, learned the lessons he needed to learn, leading to personal growth, and in the midst of his weaknesses, he still achieved some victories. At this point, David arrived at Kayla. Imagine his state of mind. He's been ha having to go through fear and despair, now he's leading these 600 men. Originally, there were 400, but the numbers kept increasing. These men were distressed and in debt, brothers who were troubled and pressured, and David had to take care of them. Yet, under immense pressure, when he heard that Keilah was under attack by the Philistines, his concern and desire to protect them remained strong. David was still a young man in his early 20s at the time. What kind of motivation enabled him to endure so much without giving up? In 1 Samuel chapter 23, 1 to 5, it describes how someone informed David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Kayla and are robbing the threshing floors. Kayla was located about 5 kilometers south of the cave of Adullam. If David were to analyze the situation rationally, as I mentioned earlier, he might think, Oh, I'm already struggling to protect myself and I'm a fugitive. Rescuing Kayla should not be my responsibility. It should have been the responsibility of the king of Israel, Saul who has an army, because I only have a group of distressed and indebted men following me. But why is David referred to as a man after God's own heart? For any brother or sister who truly has the heart of Christ, when you see God's people in trouble, it is difficult to continue with their own life. So when David heard this news, he was naturally moved, just as God would be. He cared about what God cared about. However, he didn't act impulsively. He sought the Lord's guidance. God told him to go and attack the Philistines, but his followers were like, Oh, no, no, no. Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. You know David only has 400 men. If he goes to attack Kayla and attack the Philistines, he will have two enemies. Saul wants to kill him and the Philistines. He would be caught in the middle of enemies on both sides. David's re response was remarkable. He didn't just abandon the idea because his men were scared. Dear family, we must learn from this. Saul was a man who feared people and often acted based on what others around him said. When David's followers said, no, 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 we shouldn't fight, David knew th that God had already told him to go. So he asked God again, and this time God made it even clearer. Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. In verse 5, we see David's obedience. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. In verse 6, we see that when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech had fled to David to Kayla. He had come down with an ephod in his hand. The, this ephod became a means for David to frequently seek God's will. This stands in stark contrast to Saul. 
Saul, who dared to massacre the priest, didn't care about having an ephod or a priest by his side. He never sought God's guidance. He only followed his own desires. In verses 7 to 13, we see people informing Saul that David was a Kayla. Saul prepared to go down and besiege David and his men there. David, aware of Saul's plan, asked Abiathar to bring the ephod so he could inquire of God. David asked the Lord if Saul would indeed come down, and God confirmed it. He didn't ask if the people of Kayla would hand him over to Saul, and God said they would. Hearing this, David took his 600 men, their number had grown from 400 at this time, and left Kayla. When Saul learned that David had escaped, he abandoned his plans to attack Kayla. It's important to note that the people of Kayla, like David, were from the tribe of Judah. Why would they betray David? They likely remembered what happened at Nob. If they didn't surrender David to Saul, they feared Saul would destroy their city. This shows that Kayla was extremely fearful of Saul. Knowing a king who would kill priests would definitely kill them as well. Do you see how pragmatic people can be? Kayla was also part of the tribe of Judah. They knew David had been anointed and had defeated Goliath. Initially, they supported him, but now fearing Saul, they turned into those who would betray David. Imagine how heartbroken David must have felt, everyone abandoning him except for these distressed and disconcerted men. Yet David did not become offended or bitter. Many, including myself, would struggle for a long time to overcome the bitterness caused by the betrayal. Why was David able to respond this way? Because he kept his eyes not on people but on God. He knew in his spirit that God was his only savior and reliance. Having gone through so much, David understood that only God could help him. It wasn't about receiving help from people he had been kind to. He saw through these circumstances and was not offended. Sometimes God raises up our own Kayla to teach us lessons, just as David learned his. David's actions for Kayla might seem like good deeds going un unrewarded, but to David, he did it for God. Therefore, there is no such thing as unrewarded good deeds. It only strengthened David's reliance on and focus on God. Starting in verse 14, David fled to the wilderness of Ziph, which is south of Hebron. This desolate plateau is part of the wilderness of Judah. Here, Jonathan came to see David for the last time. In verse 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh. Why is David going to see David in this case? He wanted to strengthen David to rely on God even more. The first thing he told David is, Do not be afraid. As he saw firsthand how his father Saul was determined to kill David, Jonathan encouraged David not to fear it and affirmed to him that you shall be a king over Israel and I shall be next to you. They made a covenant once again. This shows what a spiritual companion should do. When those around us are weak or disheartened, we should be like Jonathan, willing to go and encourage them despite the danger. Jonathan clearly stated that David would be king and he would be his second in command. Jonathan, the heir to the throne, showed immense humility and submission to God's will by declaring this. He said, You will be king and I will help you. I will be your second in command. This was their last meeting before Jonathan's death. In verses 19 to 24, David experienced betrayal for the second time. The Ziphites went to Saul and informed him that David was hiding in their territory, offering Saul an opportunity to capture him. Why did they do this? They likely did this out of fear of Saul and in hopes of gaining favor with him. Saul responded to them, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go, make yet more sure. No one see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. During his time in the wilderness of Ziph, David wrote Psalm 54. In this psalm, he notes that God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Despite being betrayed, David recognized that God preserved his life. This led him to say in verse 6, With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. In verses 24 to 29, David fled to the wilderness of Maon. Saul pursued him there, and in verse 26, Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David on, and his men on the other side of the mountain, and David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, so in this situation, it seems like David was trapped, but suddenly God intervened. In verses 27 to 29, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. At the most critical moment when death seemed imminent, God's deliverance arrived. David's experience in Kela, Ziph, and Maon all took place in Judah, his own tribe's territory. Yet no one from Judah helped him. Instead, they betrayed him and reported his whereabouts to Saul. Despite this, David harbored no bitterness. This is a crucial lesson for us. In Psalm 54, verse 4, David says, God is my helper, signifying that he viewed God as his sole source of help, provision, and life that everything is from God. 
He trusted that God would bring justice, as he states in verse 5. You will return the evil to my enemies, and your faithfulness put an end to them. David completely entrusted himself to God. Another significant aspect of David's response was his continuous praise of God. He refused to let fear or potential bitterness take hold of him. In verse 6, he says, With a free will offering, I will sacrifice it to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. In 1 Samuel 24, something significant happens. God provides David with an opportunity to kill Saul. Let's take a look at how David deals with his adversary Saul, who had been persistently seeking to kill him and obstruct his calling and mission. Verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul, who had not pursued the Philistines with such determination, selects 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel to chase David. Meanwhile, David only had 600 men, so he had five times fewer. Verse 3, And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Dear family, this part seems almost too miraculous, as there are so many caves, yet Saul chooses the one where David is hiding. David's men see this as a divinely appointed opportunity. They tell David, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. They tell them, Oh, it is time. They believe that this is the perfect chance, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, clearly orchestrated by God. However, David only stealthily cuts off a corner of Saul's robe instead of killing him. This act shows that David had Saul's life in his hands but chose not to take it. Dear family, verse 4 is so important. This is a key point in David's life. How he responds will affect his entire life. The people around him are begging him. This is the time. God has given Saul into your hands. David has so many reasons for killing Saul. David was the anointed one to be king. If he didn't kill Saul here, he would need to continue to be a fugitive, continuing to run away. In verse 5 and 6, after cutting off a piece of Saul's robe, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Why? The king's robe represents his authority. Cutting the robe symbolizes an act against Saul's royal authority, which God has anointed. Which means that he does not fear God because Saul is a person God has anointed, the one as God is called. So in verse 6, he called, said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put on my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Using this, David restrained his followers, not allowing them to harm Saul. Not only did he not kill or harm Saul, but he also stopped and prevented those around him from harming Saul. You can see how he fears God and knows that his life and destiny were in God's hands. He knew that if it wasn't his time, he wouldn't die. And if he was truly chosen and called to be king, no one could prevent God's promise from being fulfilled. In verse 8, David called out to Saul, saying, My lord, the king. He didn't bow down, showing respect and acknowledging Saul's kingship and not as an enemy. David questioned, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David sees your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in this cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. David displayed a piece of Saul's robe, proving that he could have killed Saul, but chose not to. He emphasized his innocence and loyalty despite Saul's attempts on his life. David blamed the rumors and accusations on those around Saul rather than accusing Saul directly. He conveyed his loyalty and respect for Saul, showing he had no intention of rebelling. David was saying, Even though you kept wanting to kill me, I had no intention of killing you back. In verse 12, David said, May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. Here, David was calling God to be the judge between him and Saul. By invoking God as the judge, we really have to fully obey God and not seek personal revenge or try to fulfill God's plans through our own means. Because whatever we do, God sees. He sees what each of us is doing. Saul was moved to tears, calling David my son and acknowledging David's righteousness compared to his own wrongdoing. Saul admitted that David had treated him well despite his malicious intent. However, Saul's moments of remorse were fleeting as his underlying rebellion and stubbornness prevented genuine repentance. Dear family, as we read this passage, we can see that God allows sudden reversals in our circumstances to test us. In chapter 23, Saul is relentlessly pursuing David, but in chapter 24, the situation suddenly reverses with David having the upper hand over Saul. When these roles were reversed, God gave them the power to act as they wished. This clearly shows the vast difference between Saul, who was fleshly, and David, who despite weaknesses, wholeheartedly sought to obey God. 
Every time God reversed their situation, Saul chose evil, while David chose righteousness. Dear family, before God establishes a leader whom we can trust, he will create situations as tests. In these situations, he will grant authority, power, and influence, and even allow the leader to face weakness, fear, betrayal, and abandonment. God wants to see how the leader will respond. Our choices determine the course of our lives, whether we please God during our earthly days and even our rewards in eternity. Our lives are shaped by many choices, not by any single person or circumstance. May the Lord help us to confess and repent immediately when fear, bitterness, unforgiveness, selfishness, or greed are revealed in us. We must also fight against our flesh. David became a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, but because he was willing to acknowledge his sins and fight against the flesh, enabling him to love God, obey God, and respond to God wholeheartedly, to please God. Dear family, let us continue to entrust our difficulties to God, like David did, inviting God to examine and intervene by refusing to seek revenge or act by our own means. When we do this, we can bring God's presence and actions into our situations. People may act in certain ways, but God is always watching. Let us continue to rely on Him, believing that God will surely intervene. Amen. Dear Bible Race viewers and families in Christ, thank you for watching our videos. We hope our sharing can enrich your life. If you find the content helpful, we hope you will support our ministry so we may continue to produce high-quality videos to serve the kingdom of God and hope to bless more people's lives. You can donate in the following ways. Online giving by PayPal. If you are residing in Taiwan, you may also donate by bank transfer. Thanks again for your viewing and support. Every contribution is our greatest encouragement. We sincerely appreciate your support. May God bless you abundantly. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.